Hello, everyone. It is Glenn with the Northeast Georgia History Center. Glad to have you on this, our digital broadcast, for the week preceding July 4th. We've got something we want to talk about with you. How do you know that you were born? I mean, you're here, obviously, but how do you know? How would you prove that if you had to go to court or you had to show someone a document? You would show them your birth certificate. And so today, what we're going to be talking about in effect, is the birth certificate of the United States. Now, it is a document. I'm just going to go out on a limb and assume that everyone is somewhat familiar with the uh, U.S. Declaration of Independence, but I wanted to talk a little bit about the history, about the philosophy behind it, about the uh, what happened uh, to the words, what happens to the actual document, and then you know take some questions, and we can sort of hash through and discuss this thing because, full disclosure, this is probably my favorite single document from history. It's just, there, there's so many things to it. Uh, it's poetry, it's music, it's legal mumbo jumbo. It's all the things that you need a good document to be, a good primary source. So we're going to jump right in. So as I said, it's sort of the, the birth certificate of the United States. And in the throes of revolution in the early 1770s, the colonists uh, here in America were trying to figure out exactly where they fit into the larger British Empire, where they fit into the world. And as we've stated in some of our previous programs, during the French and Indian War and immediately following, the folks in the colonies were incredibly proud and happy to be a part of the British Empire. They were part of the, a very successful uh, group of conglomerated states, all controlled, or I should say colonies, all controlled by, by Parliament and the King in London. Uh, they had a good government. It was a government that was fairly liberal, that respected the rights of the individual, the rights of corporations. It was uh, incredibly profitable. There were more or less free markets. Uh, it opened up the world to trade. It allowed a lot of protection for internationally traded goods on ships because of the British Navy and, to a certain extent, the British Army, and to a underappreciated sense, the British legal system. So it was a good thing to be part of the British Empire, but to rule this new empire that Britain found that it had achieved at the end of the French and Indian War, it needed to put some things into place. It needed to control a vast geographic area in a way that it had never had to do before. It had to deal, deal with a population that was very, very used to handling its own affairs and controlling its own destiny. It had to sort of get control of them over them, not just to determine how governing that huge geographic mass was going to go, but how the previous war was going to be paid for, and there was a lot of debt rolled up in that, and how it was uh, the new American colonies were going to be governed and paid for moving forward. So incredibly long and interesting story short, they began to pass legislations that tax people. People don't like to be taxed without representation. There becomes a lot of angst and a lot of conflict between the parliament and the American individual colonies. And it comes to blows. Um, the Boston Massacre, of course, men are killed by British soldiers who are put there as a, in effect, a police force. Boston is occupied. Uh, and and other colonies see how Massachusetts is being treated for, as they perceive it, standing up for their own rights. Now, it's also important to remember that not every one of the American colonies was a 100% fervent patriot, or Whig, as they called themselves at the time. Many people remained loyal to the crown before, during, and after the American Revolution. A, a good number of people were loyal to the idea of the British Constitution and, and monarchy and didn't want to become this weird, free, independent, dem democratic republic that had only existed in the ancient world, and there was no way it was probably going to make it in the modern world, so let's stick with what we know. But that's later. In the beginnings, people began to realize that the only way to assure what they wanted out of the colonies and out of a life in the new world that they and their ancestors had settled and literally scraped out of the hard earth to create was to gain independence. At first, this was not something everyone went along with. When the revolution started, uh, Lexington and Concord was just the violent part of that. The revolution took place in the American people's minds, as John Adams said. And then when the bullets started flying, 
lots of people were still trying to figure out how to make it so that the colonies could work within the British Empire. And they time and again, one of the strategies they use is, well, this is not the king, because if you go against the king, you're a traitor. But if you oppose parliament, you're just a good British subject opposed to tyranny. And their argument was that the parliament and the king's ministers were the ones doing all the bad things, suppressing American rights and things like that. So they went back and forth, and they offered what was called the Olive Branch Petition that basically was sent to the king, not to parliament, not to ministers. It was sent directly to the king, and in effect it read, We feel that your ministers, that your representatives have been doing you an injustice just as they have done us an injustice. We would like to treat with you directly. You are our sovereign. Why don't we work this out and remove these evil middlemen? Well, George's response, George III's response, was to issue a proclamation of rebellion. And I think we can we can bring that up here. Uh, by the king, a proclamation for suppressing rebellion and sedition. So this is not the response the colonists and, and assembled in the Second Continental Congress were expecting. They were expecting the king to go, you know what, you're right, let's work this out. Instead, what the king does, he doesn't even react to this olive branch petition from the Continental Congress. He issues this proclamation that says there are rebels in the colonies led by a despicable leadership group, and we're going to suppress them. We will forgive everyone who has been a rebel thus far. Remember, this is after Lexington and Concord. Shots have already been fired. Blood has already been spilled. Deaths have already occurred on both sides. But the king says, we'll forgive everyone except for the ringleaders. We're going to bring them down because they're traitors. We are not going to listen to any other petitions you have. You are now in a state of rebellion, and we will use any force necessary that we have within our power to do you in. That sort of is what pushed most people who had been on the fence over the edge. They decided that independence was the only way. If they couldn't reason with the king, that was their last hope, and now they have to find something to do. So in the Continental Congress, the the war for the war for their rights, let's call it up to that point, had been going on for almost a year, if you count going back to Lexington and Concord. And then with this movement towards independence and this final proclamation by the king, they began to debate how they would move forward with independence. And so Richard Henry Lee, a delegate from Virginia, proposes a declaration that says that these united colonies are and of right ought to be free of it, free and independent states and that they are absolved from any connection or allegiance to the British crown. And everyone's like, well, that's a big step. We're only representatives of our respective colonies. We have to get instructions. And so they agree to uh, have a, a couple of weeks recess for the Continental Congress. And they say, but if we decide to declare independence, let's get a document together that says we're declaring independence and give the reasons why. This is the beginnings of the declaration itself. And John Adams is appointed chair of this committee, along with uh, Thomas Jefferson, Benjamin Franklin, and a couple of other people whose names I can't recall because they didn't have much to do with the declaration. But you can go look them up if you want. So Adams basically gets together and says, okay, Jefferson, you're going to write this. Jefferson says, why? He says, well, three reasons. First, everyone hates me, and no one will take what I have to say seriously. Number two, you're a Virginian, and Virginia should be at the head of this business. And number three, you have a remarkable ability to write. I've, I've read the things you've written. It's eloquent. It's well-founded. It's perfect. So you're going to write it. Jefferson sort of tries to beg out of it, but it's Jefferson who's placed in charge of writing the draft. So over a period of about, I want to say, 15 to, to 20 days, and he's busy doing other things. It's not like he sits and he writes and works on this draft for 20 days. But here and there, sort of like a student who has a big paper due the next day, it takes him a couple of days to get it out. And and there's a draft, Jefferson's draft, that exists of when he was writing the Declaration. This is probably even a later draft that he's written and he's made some changes to. So you can see up there a, pro a, a Declaration of the Representatives of the United States of America – in Continental Congress assembled, I'm sorry, in General Congress assembled, and you can see where things have been scratched through. And, and this is probably one of the later ones because one of the um, changes made 
he had said that we hold these truths to be sacred and undeniable. And you can see that in, the, in that paragraph right there. We hold these truths to be sacred and undeniable. And it was Benjamin Franklin who said, that seems a little bit over-the-top religious. Why don't we just say they're self-evident because they are what they are? So that document still exists, Jefferson's draft of it. And they, the committee goes through, makes a, a few more changes, and then they present it to Congress after it has reassembled on, I believe, June 28th. So they say, here is our draft. And the Congress says, thanks, we'll do some changes on this, we'll do some work. So for two days, they sit there, and from Jefferson's point of view, they butcher his document that he took a lot of time to write. Um, and Franklin tells him a couple of stories to try to make him feel better about it. He can't leave the room because that would be ungentlemanly. He can't defend his own work because that would be ungentlemanly, so he has to stand there and take it. Ironically, most of the stuff that we think of today the sort not the preamble, but those first couple of paragraphs that speak of fundamental natural human rights, they weren't too worried about, right? That was, as far as they were concerned, boilerplate. What the Congress was worried about are all the reasons being listed that compel them to the separation. So they go back and forth about that for two days, trying to change some of the wording, and they eventually do. And then they table that and put it to the side. And then the Congress goes into what they call a committee of the whole. The entire Congress debates the independence resolution that Richard Henry Lee had put forward. And on July 2nd, 1776, that resolution is adopted. Now, depending on whose argument you listen to, Adams thought he'd written the declaration by Congress that he thought would be the declaration moment. We think of the Declaration of Independence and we celebrate our Independence Day on July 4th but really, from a technical legal perspective, the moment the Congress unanimously declared itself independent with Richard Henry Lee's uh, proposition, that's when independence is created, on July 2nd. And that's what John Adams writes in his journal, this is going to be the greatest day in American history. It will be celebrated with parades and fireworks and things like that. Well, he was two days off. But... So after they adopt that, then they go ahead and they adopt on July 4th this Declaration of Independence. And they immediately, and, and so the one that we all think of that's in the, uh, the Library of Congress in the archives that you think of that's all the nice, beautiful penmanship and things like that, that's not what we're talking about. Right now, the Declaration of Independence is just the ideas and the agreed-upon words so what happens is Congress takes the draft that they've worked on and scratched on and approved, and they send that off to a printer that very day to, a, to a Mr. Dunlap. Let me make sure. Yes, John Dunlap. Um, and he, so that first original draft, the odds are he probably took it and he cut it up into a bunch of pieces and handed it out to some of his workers and said, here, create the prints and put these together. And so the next day he has the broadside printed, and we can, I, I know that's the one we were looking at before, Leva, uh, the Dunlap, the Dunlap broadside. Yes, so this is the one, uh, we think about 200 copies were made by Dunlap, so this is really the first official document that makes the rounds. They send a copy or two to each individual colony, um, they send one to Great Britain, uh, a couple people keep them as souvenirs. They send a couple to the Continental Army so Washington knows. Remember, the Continental Army has been fighting for a year. Now they're fighting for independence. Now it becomes a war for independence. And so this Dunlap broadside becomes the one people think of. And quite frankly, at this point, the fact that Thomas Jefferson is the primary author doesn't even matter, and hardly anyone knows that. That's not the point. The wording in the Declaration is kind of not the point. The point is that Independence has been declared, right? That's the big issue. And so the war goes on. And we achieve our independence not just in thoughts, but by deeds and reality with the Treaty of Paris in 1783, where Great Britain officially recognizes the independence of the 13 United States. Not of the United States, but of the 13 individual United States. And so then America has to sort of create a country they have the Articles of Confederation that don't work. They begin to, uh, then they come together, they create the Constitution. 
uh, in Philadelphia in the exact same room that um, the Continental Congress usually met in in Philadelphia. And as a matter of fact, they used the exact same inkwell to sign the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. I just think that's kind of neat. There's a there's a picture of it right there. Uh, it's the same. Now, of course, the quill is lost to history. Those are as disposable as, you know, ballpoint pens and, and sharpened pencils. But there's the thing they used to sign both those important documents because they met in the exact same place. So when you go to Independence Hall in Philadelphia, which used to be the Pennsylvania State House, that's what you're going to see. So we've achieved independence. We've fought the war. We've won the war. We have a constitution. Washington is president. And then John Adams is president. And then some divisions are created within this brand new American government and parties start to develop. And one of the parties sort of centers around Washington and Adams and Hamilton, the Federalist Party. And another one starts to jail around Thomas Jefferson. It is at this time to sort of boost him as, boost his credentials as a real founding father that it is widely spread that he is the one who wrote the Declaration of Independence, that it was his brainchild. Even though it had been edited by Congress and lots of people added to it, Jefferson becomes the author of the Declaration of Independence. And at that point, that attribution starts to be a big deal, and the wording of the Declaration starts to be a big deal. Um, that engrossed copy, by the way, that, that everyone thinks of, so uh, the Dunlap broadside is the most important one. That's the one that's spread around. And then after that, Congress says, we want an engrossed copy. What they mean is a fancy penmanship written out sheet of paper and that they all agree to sign. Because Hancock is a, John Hancock, who is president of the Congress, is the only one who's at the bottom of most of the declarations, especially from the Dunlap broadside. But they all wanted to be a part of it. So they created this engrossed copy later in July, and then over the next several weeks, the individual representatives of the state who were there sign it, and that's the one that we have in the in the Library of Congress today. So that's a very important document. That's the one that they all signed. They touched with their hands. It's, it's the power of the object, right? It's an amazing piece of history. But the idea of independence was much more important on July 4th than that actual document. That document that we look at in the archives didn't even exist on July 4th, 1776. So that's the Declaration of Independence history. What does it actually say? This is an important part. This is why I like to study this document because a lot of people, I mean, look at Richard Henry Lee's um, resolution that the United that these United Colonies are and of right ought to be free and independent states that they absolve all their connection and allegiance to the British Crown. Done. Why do you have to say any more than that? You're declaring independence. Part of the beauty of what Jefferson did, because he was such an, an erudite and educated man, is he decided to make this document not just a declaration of American independence and not just give the causes for it, but to set the larger, broader perspective of the Enlightenment. What are natural rights? What gives us the right to do this? Why is it important that all these reasons compel us to this separation? That's the beauty of the Declaration of Independence. That's why that first part that they consider boilerplate is the stuff that means the most to us, right? When we look at the Declaration of Independence, we read those first two paragraphs, and then, quite frankly, our eyes start to glaze over until we get to the last paragraph. It's it, Because it's a difference in generation of what they thought was important versus what we thought was important, right? And... I'm sure most of y'all know those 25 important words, probably the most oft-recited, most well-known words in the English language. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, and that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Right? Those are the ones we know. Those are the ones that sing to us because... I do think the Declaration, it's America's music, right? There, there are different religions in the world that look to their scripture. Uh, Islam has the Quran, and Christianity has the New Testament, and Judaism has the Torah. Well, Americans have the Declaration of Independence. This is our sacred scripture. This is what 
defines us. This is what defines the best of us, I should say. This is what sets the goal for what we want to be. And they weren't there in 1776, and we're not there in 2020. But the, the, the music that is in this document is what sets us apart and what makes us want to do things, right? We hold these truths to be self-evident. Everyone can pick up on it. You can look and see that liberties and freedoms, are they just are, right? All men are created equal. Now, of course, we use men because it's the 18th century, but all people are created equal. Done. They're endowed by a creator with certain unalienable rights. Unalienable means they cannot be changed, removed, altered, taken away. They simply exist because you exist. They are unalienable. And that among these, not only these, but among those unalienable rights are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, right? Freedom of will, freedom of action to determine the course of your life and what you want to do. And I know I'm harping on these 25 words, but I think they're so important because they inspire us and they've inspired generations not only of Americans, but of world citizens. So many countries have looked back to this document for their own declarations of independence, for their own um, expression of what their ideals of the best selves that they want to be, what they can be, they look back to this document. And I keep pointing over here, by the way, because I have my big copy of the Dunlap broadside, which I I don't always carry it with me, but it's it's a pretty good reference because it's big and it has all the all the information in there. And there's a lot of those reasons, you know, that we go through that we can that we can see. And, uh, you know, side note, apparently this is very revolutionary text. I think it was, was it three or four years ago uh, that someone posted the text of the Declaration of Independence on Facebook and it was removed as violating community standards because it was an incitement to violence. Isn't that interesting? They, have, they, they reversed that decision um, but but it was actually removed because it was against community standards. Pretty pretty interesting. And then this last paragraph here. Let me. Uh, I think it's important to go over it too. That we therefore the representatives of the United States of America in General Congress assembled, appealing to the Supreme Judge of the world for the rectitude of our intentions, do in the name and by authority of the good people of the colonies solemnly publish and declare that these united colonies are and of right ought to be free and independent states, that they are absolved from all allegiance to the British crown and that all political connection between them and the state of Great Britain is and ought to be totally dissolved. And that as free as independent states, they have full power to levy war, conclude peace, contract alliances, establish commerce, and do all other acts and things which independent states may of right do. And for the support of this declaration, with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. Right? They all agreed to this. They were committing treason against the most powerful military and the most powerful government and the largest economy in the entire world. Right? We look back now and we know that America won the war, and that we've become the superpower. But in 1776, this was almost a shot in the dark. They had nothing to go on but their ideals and their hope. And they pulled it off, people. Well, with the help of France and Spain and a whole lot of luck. But they did pull it off because this is what they wanted to do. That's the Declaration of Independence. And and the causes are important, too. I'm not going to go through them. Like I said, our eyes glaze over. But there's some important ones in there, and a lot of them made it into the Constitution. You can't quarter troops in, in people's private homes. Um, you know, sending in troops to try to enforce law is in here. They thought that was a cause for separation. Um, lots of things in this document still resonate through to the, the, the current day. And these Dunlap broadsides, like I said, about 200 were made. I think only about 24 exist. And some of you may have heard it was in, uh, I think back in the 90s, someone bought an old frame print at a flea market for $4, and they got it home, and they were going to have the print reframed, and they went to tear the paper off the back of the frame. And here sat 
one of those Dunlap broadsides, which in 2002, I think, sold for $8 million. That is a fantastic investment. So tear through those frames at the flea markets, people. You never know what you're going to find back there. Declaration of Independence, it defines who we are, or at least, again, who we want to be. And, you know, the question of slavery. All men are created equal, written by a person who owned slaves and much of the Southern aristocracy at the time who signed this document owned slaves. Slavery is the, the great conundrum in American history. It's, it's, the, it's the violation and compartmentalization of the ideals versus the reality. And yet I don't think that it discounts the ideas that are in this document. It's the ideas in this document that it took a war a few generations later to end slavery in America, but that's the inspiration. Look at look at Abraham Lincoln's writings and speeches. He is constantly hearkening back to this document. Martin Luther King in his speeches is constantly hearkening back to this document. You know, he said that that uh, when when African Americans tried to cash the check of freedom, that it said insufficient funds. He didn't say that the bank should be destroyed because the check is good. The funds should be there to, to reimburse for it, just to carry on his metaphor. So the words are there, um, and they're important. And I know this has sort of turned into a preaching, so I'm going to get off of my soapbox and see if there are any questions or comments out there that we can kind of look at the history, Jefferson's thoughts, uh, Hobbes versus Locke, Leviathan, the Enlightenment. There's all kinds of stuff in there that we can pull from. Oh, my gosh, I, I anticipated Louisa's question. She says, in school we learned that the founders were influenced by John Locke and the Enlightenment. But what influenced Thomas Jefferson specifically with the Declaration of Independence? Uh, any professors from, uh, professors from William & Mary, his own forward-thinking views? Yes, Thomas Jefferson pulled from a lot of different sources. John Locke was certainly one of them, right? Uh, John Locke said, uh, life, liberty, and property. Thomas Jefferson turned that to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Uh, a fellow named George Wythe was a professor at William & Mary and turned into probably the most important mentor, father figure, male figure in Jefferson's life. Um, you can still actually visit his house today when you go to Williamsburg. But he was part of the Scottish Enlightenment, and he is the one who not only introduced Jefferson to these ideas, because it's one thing to introduce people to ideas, but he's the one who constantly forced Jefferson to wrestle with them, to question them, to readopt them, to incorporate them into his own way of thinking. So definitely George Wythe played that role. Uh, you know, John Locke, he never met John Locke, of course, but, but John Locke was one of the three men that Jefferson considered the most important men in history, the other two being uh, Isaac Newton and Francis Bacon. But, but definitely George Wythe. And, you know, there's no doubt that Jefferson had been influenced by the people around him. Uh, he was only in his 30s, you know, when he's at the Continental Congress. He's, a very, he's actually a very quiet and a very shy person. He is, by no stretch of the imagination, uh, a social butterfly or a public orator. Uh, he hardly says sentences together in Congress, John Adams uh, says. But, but he, he had that talent with a pen, and he was influenced by a lot of things. But it took someone of Jefferson's insight and education and, and talent to take all of those ideas that were the Enlightenment and the American causes for freedom and synthesize them into a one-page one manifesto. Let's see, David asks, uh, this seems to be an, acceptance, be an acceptance by America for the Declaration, but not the independence for the Confederacy. What was the difference? I think it depends on who's declaring independence from who. Um, you know, the British, of course, rejected the idea of their people, as they saw it, declaring independence. Um, the United States saw that the separation of the Union, or at least the, the, the federal powers in the North, thought that you couldn't get out of the Union once you got in. And this was not necessarily, at least at first, a Northern thought. A, a, a president as virulent as Andrew Jackson, right? Andrew Jackson, born in South Carolina, lived in Tennessee, slave owner, but when he was president, he firmly believed in 
the sanctity of the union and that it could not be broken um, no matter what. And so, you know, that thought carried over. So, but, but Southern independence, when Southern independence was declared, um, you know, just, just to, to go into this very briefly, when you look at the, the statements the South makes when it declares independence and the reasons for it, they're trying to make it like something that Jefferson would have written with these appeals to, to natural rights and, and the, the benefits of humanity in terms of individual rights and things like that. But, but the Confederacy's Declaration of Independence for their individual states, as well as the documents that created the Confederacy in general, put slavery at the absolute center of why they were declaring independence and removing themselves from the Union. Um, in 1860, that may have been for many a legitimate reason, but looking back at that today, comparing Southern independence to the Declaration of Independence for the United States, the wording and the purported causes for that independence simply don't mesh. Uh, slavery is bad, and it is no cause on which to establish a nation, one could argue. Uh, the Declaration didn't grow out of a vacuum. How would you expound upon the generation of the Declaration of Independence as a continuation of thought from the Glorious Revolution, Magna Carta, and the monotheistic foundations of Christianity? That is a big question uh, and a legitimate question. I think it is important to sort of see it as 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 a continuation. Um, and you, you know, you mentioned Glorious Revolution and Magna Carta. That's part. That's sort of what makes the the Declaration unique. Because the British, when I say the British Constitution, the British Constitution actually isn't written like the U.S. Constitution. It's sort of a combined body of law that people reference that is law and precedent and tradition. It's not written down black and white on paper, so it makes it a little more open to interpretation. But the British Constitution, especially in the 18th century, was seen as the continued culmination of a very free society, the freest. That's why the British are so sure that they're better than all the other Europeans, right? They've had the independence of the Anglo-Saxon race before the Normans came in and ruined it. They had the Glorious Revolution. Uh, Magna Carta severely limited the power of the king and put it into, well, maybe not the people, but more than one person, right? And, and, and Christianity, especially uh, Church of England, sort of magnified and amplified that thought. So the British saw themselves with some legitimate justification as the most free society in Europe. Um, they were the, the markets were free, the individuals were free. And so when the Americans begin to agitate and get upset that they think their rights are being violated and that the Americans are paying far less of a tax rate than British citizens actually in England and Scotland, the British are very confused and very disappointed that the Americans are sort of rejecting this great tradition that has been British freedom. And so the British almost see the Americans as petulant children who aren't getting what they want, quite frankly. Whereas the Americans certainly see themselves, certainly see the the declaration, the, well, the ideas espoused in the Declaration and American independence as the next step, as an evolution from what the British... The, in other words, the British have taken us this far, and it looks like they can't take us any further. Now it's our turn to create a non-monarchical government where the sovereign is the people. So when you look at it that way, uh, maybe as an American, of course, I'm going to say that makes sense. We, we're changing the sovereign to the, the people as a whole rather than uh, the monarch. So there is a lot of precedent that goes along with the, with the uh, Declaration of Independence, but, but how far that went sort of depends upon which side of the pond you sit upon. Uh, Bonnie asks, uh, could you discuss who George's signers were and talk about John Hancock's signature? Yes, I can do that. So let me do John Hancock first. So John Hancock um, was the president of the Continental Congress, uh, he was a Massachusetts fellow and was president of the Second Continental Congress at the time when Declaration was debated, 
um, voted on and the Declaration of Independence itself was adopted. So, you know, he was sort of the guy who presided over all that. It's not the same as the president today under the Constitution. He had much less power, but he was definitely the figurehead. And again, at the time, it was going to be too complicated to get everyone to sign it. They had to get the declaration out, which is why on the Dunlap broadside, even though it says, you know, it says signed by order and on behalf of the Congress, comma, John Hancock, president. So, and you know, it's interesting too. So when they, the Dunlap broadside comes out the next day that they, the, the, it's adopted, the engrossed copy that I talked about that's in the National Archives that everyone has signed, um, they wanted to make sure it changed it. So the text actually changed in the engrossed copy. It says a unanimous declaration in the engrossed copy. The original draft from the Congress and the Dunlap broadside does not say unanimous. But they wanted to make sure that that was a big part of what went forward in posterity. Now, who were the people who signed for Georgia? There were three of them. Um, Button Gwinnett, Lyman Hall, and uh, William Few. Not William Few. Button Gwinnett, Lyman Hall. Now I can't remember the third one, Libba. I can't believe this. Let's see. We've got... Um, no, Abraham, Abraham Baldwin signed the Constitution. Uh, George Walton. George Walton. Oh, my gosh. I'm getting... Abraham Few and... Uh, no, William Few and Abraham Baldwin signed the Constitution for Georgia. Uh, Bunt Gwinnett, Lyman Hall, and George Walton signed the Declaration on behalf of Georgia. I'm so sorry. Um, so uh, they were all three at the Continental Congress, uh, obviously. Georgia was a weird state. It was probably the most loyal of all the 13 colonies to Great Britain and had the biggest trouble trying to get a revolutionary anti-British fervor going uh, down here. And so uh, Bud Gwinnett was definitely a hothead. Um, he was fairly wealthy. He had bought an entire island. And after um, he was appointed to the Continental Congress, he shortly after came back to Georgia and became president of the Committee of Safety and wanted to lead an expedition to take British Florida. And one of the ranking officers of the Georgia military was uh, Lachlan McIntosh. And they butted heads like crazy. They didn't get along. The expedition got halfway there. It fell apart because of miscommunication and poor supply lines and things like that. When they dragged themselves back into Savannah, it turned into uh, a little whiny contest, each blaming the other, insulting the other, which leads to a duel. And uh, Lachlan McIntosh kills Button Gwinnett in the duel. Um, so Button Gwinnett is actually buried in Savannah in Colonial Cemetery. And ironically, of all the signers of the Declaration of Independence, his autograph is the most valuable among collectors, more so than Washington, more so than Franklin, more so than Jefferson, because he didn't live long enough to sign many documents. So the actual signatures that were in existence are far, far fewer than someone who's a much bigger public figure like Washington or, or, or the big name, or uh, Jefferson. Uh, Washington didn't sign the Declaration of Independence, I'm sorry. Uh, Jefferson or Franklin or folks like that. Um, Lyman Hall, for whom Hall County is named, and I, as a coincidence, Northeast Georgia History Center is actually in Hall County. Uh, he was a doctor and a scholar, and he moved from, I believe, Connecticut down to Georgia and very much uh, became a supporter of American rights and American liberties and was voted to the Continental Congress. He signs it, comes back, becomes the first governor, or excuse me, one of the first governors of the sovereign state of Georgia, the new independent state of Georgia, and signs some legislation that begins, sort of sets the standard for education in the state and more or less creates the University of Georgia. University of Georgia. So Lyman Hall, and uh, he, he dies peacefully years later, practices medicine, things like that. George Walton uh, also becomes uh, president of the, of the new state of Georgia and serves in the military to a certain extent. And to be honest, I can't remember what happens to George Walton, but I do believe he lives on for a while. So those were Georgia's three signers of the Declaration of Independence. Um, how did the tradition get started that Americans use fireworks to celebrate Independence Day? Um, 
that's a, that's a good question. So for cel- certain celebrations, and uh, for example, when the Declaration was read, the uh, the American forces and those in Philadelphia and the Continental Army, they always wanted to do something called a feu de joie, which is French for a fire of joy. So they would fire cannons and muskets into the air in celebration of momentous events such as declaring independence. Um, and there were fireworks that existed as a, as a form of, of celebratory joy. And even John Adams, when he was talking about July 2nd being the most important day in American history, he said that it would be celebrated with fireworks and things like that. So even from the very beginning, celebrations of the Declaration were accompanied by flashes of light and big bangs, whether that's firing guns into the air, whether that's using very primitive fireworks, or where we get to today where there's just fireworks every 4th of July, except for this one, apparently, which is, I, oh well, go to, if you take your fireworks to your house and be careful with your fingers, folks, but make some kind of bang to celebrate. Um, can you talk about the Declaration of the Rights of Women at Seneca Falls, and was this inspired by the Declaration of Independence? It was inspired by the Declaration of Independence because uh, the Declaration uh, at Seneca Falls was basically uh, there was a, a convention of women uh, suffragists who were trying to establish women's rights and equality under the law. And they uh, basically created a decora- declaration that sounds and borrows a lot of language from this that basically says that you know women also should have the right to vote, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, just like men. Right, and so so the Seneca Falls Declaration was very very much modeled after the Declaration of Independence, and really was an effort to have women come as equals into the public sphere. Uh, Thomas Jefferson's Welsh heritage did he discuss? Excuse me, did he speak Welsh? I don't think Welsh is a language that he spoke. He was. He had some Welsh in him. He had some Scotch in him. And because of George With and his other teachers, we think he probably spoke with a slight uh, Scotch accent. But, of course, unfortunately, we're, we're not sure. Uh, I don't think Welsh was a language he spoke, but he spoke or could read English, French, Spanish, Latin, Greek, and, believe it or not, Anglo-Saxon. Uh, like like Beowulf Anglo-Saxon. And as a matter of fact, for a short time, he was trying to encourage people that once we achieved our independence here in the United States, that we would drop English as our language and adopt Anglo-Saxon. And he figured if we taught it in schools, we could get there in a generation. That man, I swear. Um, was the Declaration ever legally challenged in the years following? Uh, the The... The British issued a proclamation rejecting it shortly after word arrived in London that it had been declared. But at the Treaty of Paris in 1783, uh, one of the stipulations of the treaty was that Great Britain had to recognize the independence of the United States. And when that treaty was signed, uh, any other of, of the British uh, opposition to the declaration became a moot point because they recognized independence and they basically did not deny, they could no longer deny the causes that impelled the separation to take place. So not, no, not legally, um, you know, not legally questioned in any way. And you know, the, that's the thing is it's a, it's a document but it's really at its heart, it's ideas. So you could take every copy of the Declaration of Independence and destroy it um, like they tried to do in National Treasure. That's a joke for those of you who have seen the movie. But the, the ideas would still be there. And, you know, that's, that's what was important to them, and that's really what should be important to us. Trust me, I work in a museum. I love the fact that there are objects from history that were there and that saw things or represent certain other ideas, but man, the ideas are, are the ideas themselves are what is critical. Uh, were there any women fighting for their rights during the formation of the Declaration of Independence? So that's a good question. Uh, depends on how you define your terms. Fighting? Uh, maybe not in the military. Uh, I know that there's there are uh, you know some folks who say there were women 
who dressed as men and fought in the revolution, probably very few, far fewer than those who fought in the American Civil War. Women did follow the armies. They may not have been actually pulling triggers and firing cannons in large numbers, but they certainly did follow the army, and they did that to support their husbands or the cause. There were women who were spies for the American cause. Uh, and Abigail Adams, uh, you know, John Adams' wife, when he was writing to her before the dec- before Declaration of Independence took place, he's telling her what's going on, and he's saying, you know, I think, I think we're going to make this. I think we're going to be able to achieve independence. And she writes this famous letter called Remember the Ladies Letter. And in it, she basically says, you know, remember the ladies, John, because we make up half the population here. And just as you are fighting for your rights uh, because you deserve them, then we deserve those too. And if we are denied those rights, just as you have been, perhaps we will rise up in our own revolution and put an end to your tyranny. And you can kind of maybe hear her say, ha ha, not really. But uh, but those two, you know, had a great relationship. So there were women certainly had an idea of what they were trying to accomplish. But the times were very different, uh, and most women probably accepted. And there's nothing wrong with this, by the way. This is not a judgment. Women accepted their place in that society. It just was their place in that society. But there were also lots of ideas that maybe things could change since we're starting the world over again. Um. What did the remaining loyalists do after the United States declared independence? Well, immediately after they declared independence, a lot of them formed loyalist militias and fought against the Whigs and try, who were trying to gain their independence. So there were a lot of domestic folks who joined militias or joined loyalist provincial units to fight on the side of king and country. Um, but of course, the United States won its war for independence and was declared or did achieve its independence. And after that, Uh, Most states passed laws that didn't necessarily tell the loyalists they had to leave the new country, but it did if it could be proved that a person was a loyalist and had fought against the United States, all of their property could be seized and they would lose all their property, whether that was uh, land, a business, slaves, wagons, anything like that. Their property was confiscated by the state. Uh, to pay the state's debts or, or what have you. So a lot of loyalists decided, of course, just to take what they could, pick up, and move somewhere else. So a lot of them went down to the Caribbean. Uh, a lot of them went back to England. Some of them went up to Canada. But by and large, uh, loyalists left the United States. And again, think about it. If you had fought for a king and country, do you really want to stay around with all of your neighbors knowing what you had done, it was going to even even if you could reestablish your life, and even if you could keep your property, it's not going to be a very friendly environment to be in with with people you know hating on you because of of what you had done to support your beliefs. Ah, to what extent was the War of eighteen twelve a postscript or a counter to the War for Independence? Oh, that's a that's a heck of a question you've got there. How long do we have left? <laughs> Ten minutes, I can almost cover the... No, that is a great question, and I, it's, it's a very good question. It, it's legitimate because we have to put ourselves in the mindset of the past, right? So, Americans, French and Indian War, proud to be part of the British Empire. After the French and Indian War, Britain's the oppressor. We have to fight a war against Great Britain for our independence. We achieve independence. Britain grumbles about it. And Britain's not leaving the forts in the Midwest, what's now the Midwest, like they said they were going to. Britain is no longer being a friendly trading ally. Britain thinks the United States is going to fail. A lot of European countries think the United States is going to fail. And they're just sort of sitting over there on the edge waiting to pounce. The British are inciting the Native Americans to fight against uh, the, the Patriots. And so even though we won the War of Independence, Great Britain is still the enemy, right? So as we move on and the, and the British dominance of the ocean takes over because of the Napoleonic Wars, and that's what you have to do is frame all of this in the image of the Napoleonic Wars, 
Here is France that had thrown off a king, declared itself a republic, and was trying to rule itself with uh, a populace that was considered sovereign. Does that sound familiar? So the United States thinks it's great that France is now a republic. Great Britain is fighting against France. The United States is getting pulled into that war. And the United States sees this as a way to assert its new power and maybe take over Canada. Well, long story short, Britain defeats France, sends an army over here, and then we have to fight against it. They burn our capital, right? They burn the capital. They go south. It looks like they're going to take the south. And Andrew Jackson stops the British army at New Orleans, and they leave, and they sign a treaty. And again, looking back, we know that that was the last big war we had with Great Britain. But from their perspective, it wasn't the last time we were going to fight them. Britain stayed the enemy through the 1830s, through the 1840s. There were issues over Oregon and what became Oregon and Washington State. Um, there were, and even up to the Civil War, the United States didn't know if Great Britain was going to join the side of the Confederacy and start a war with the United States, with the Northern States. So Great Britain was always sort of seen as that the big brother who's trying to, to undo us and, and, and try to get back what they lost. So yeah, the, the War of 1812 was certainly a way for the United States to assert itself against what it saw as a continued interference politically and economically from Great Britain. Absolutely, certainly. Is that it? All right. Well, gosh, y'all, thank you so much for joining us. We are, of course, open here at the History Center. We've got a lot of great events coming up. Be sure and keep up with that on Facebook and on our website. And until we see you again, whether online or at the History Center, stay safe and take care. Thank you.